Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so today I'm talking about um, deriving hydroecological relationships uh, for temporary rivers um, and taking a trait-based approach um, to that work. Um, this was conducted as part of research for the, for the Goiter Institute a couple of years ago and I'd like to acknowledge my um, co-contributors Douglas Green and, and Luke Peters. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge David Schmar for all the photographs um, throughout the talk. Uh, so to start off with, I think it's always helpful to have a conception model. So, um, we're, so within, within the Mount Lofty Ranges, um, abstraction from farm dams is, is a critical factor. Um, it's taking flow, from, um, taking flow from the rivers that otherwise would receive them and changing um, the flow regime in a number of ways. Um, including uh, the number of zero flow days or the intermittency uh, within those rivers. This has on, on flow effects, um, impacts water quality, in-stream habitats, geomorphology, and also um, fish, macro invertebrates, and vegetation. And this project um, looked more broadly at fish, macro invertebrates, and vegetation, uh, but today this talk I'll be focusing on um, macro invertebrates uh, and the hydroecological models that we um, created using those data. Oh, that's right. So we're using hydrological and ecological metrics to develop data-driven models um, that predict responses to new and existing flow regimes. So as I said, the, um, the indicators that we used for this were fish, vegetation and macroinvertebrates. Um, and I think one of the rare things we were able to do in this project um, was actually to collect that data at the same time. So we've got, we've got our vegetation sampling happening here, our fish nets here um, and macroinvertebrates being collected all at the same sites. But although I won't be talking that, about that today, that's a, that's a, the data set um, exists where those, those three um, um, biota can be compared. So this is also um, a look at how we think um, intermittency will affect um, macroinvertebrates and, and, and their traits. Uh, so over here we can see that I've got um, a highly connected um, stream where you've got pools that are connected um, uh, throughout the river system. And in, this, in these kind of areas, we would predict higher alpha, beta, and gamma diversity, so the diversity within each individual pool and also overall all the different pools. And we would predict that as, um, as these systems get drier, that we would see lower, a lower diversity and that we'd also see differences in the traits that these species possess. And perhaps to go back a little bit, um, traits are just the characteristics of species um, that, they, uh, yeah, that, they, that they possess. So one of those is univoltanism in terms of the number of generations per year. Um, we predict that, that they would have um, yeah, lower numbers of generations per year, low tolerance to poor water quality, um, dispersed by drift, have slow development, um, and rheophily is just a, a fancy word for flow loving. Um, down this lower end of the, of the spectrum, you'd see that you'd have traits such as multivoltanism. That's a lot of generations per year. Um, they'd be uh, adapted to poorer water quality dispersed along dried riverbeds perhaps and have rapid um, development uh, to be able to then, um, you know, set their next generation quickly. Um, and rear taxes or burrow burrowing into the sediments as well as a, as a strategy. So traits provide a mechanistic and functional way to understand changes to disturbance. Um, general patterns of species richness have been shown to, shown to decline with increasing intermittency. And this, is, this has been found worldwide. This, is, this study that I've shown here is actually, is actually a study from three different continents that's shown that to be a general, a general trend. So traits which convey resistance or resilience are likely to respond differently to changes in intermittency, which we would define as a ramp disturbance, and ramp disturbance meaning something that um, increases in severity over time. Now, resistance is also a, is a species' ability uh, to resist perturbation, whereas resilience is its ability to bounce back, back once that perturbation has subsided. And this is the area in which we've worked um, and the sampling locations um, that we were able to use for the study. Um, this was, the study was conducted in both the east and the western Mount Lofty ranges. Um, and, yeah, you can see that there, which is, has, is an area with um, over 4,000 dams present. So in terms, of, in terms of the flow in these areas, we've seen a drying trend since 1970 and an increase in those levels of intermittency or number of zero flow days. Um, we've seen in the ephemeral catchments, a lot of those, lot of those in, in the Mount Lofty ranges are naturally ephemeral. Um, we've seen largest flow reductions, um, increases in low, inc increased low flow spells um, and increased cool season runoff. 
in perennial catchments, we've seen zero flu spells during droughts, so um, no longer actually perennial in those circumstances. And this is some graphs from some of the gauging stations um, across the Mount Lofty Ranges. And you can see that there is a general increase over time uh, in um, zero flow days. Um, so from the literature and from our work, we thought that this was a fairly key um, flow metric to, um, to look into. Um, and, that's, and we've progressed that. So we, we developed through the project um, 44 new and existing field sites. Um, we had an abstraction gradient of 5 to 25 percent of runoff. We had different reach types, so we collected samples from um, along uh, the river channels. Um, and we also um, worked to make sure that they were close to flow gauge sites so that we were able to directly relate those data to each other. Um, we measured macroinvertebrates. We did a detailed assessment and we also took rapid samples that were able to be related to the long-term um, data that ha has been monitored, monitored in the state um, since about 1994. And those were the data that we were able to um, most um, readily um, relate to the flow data because we had a longer record. So the ecological metrics that we decided to use um, were species richness because we'd seen that those trends in, um, in global literature. Um, and then also we decided to develop trait groups. So we did this, and I'll show you how we did that in the next part of the talk. Um, which represents similar ecological function um, and likely tolerance to low flows. And one of the advantages of using traits rather than, or trait groups rather than species classifications is that this can be potentially translated to other areas in the state. Um, and then we also looked at some of the individual traits, but I won't present that today. So trait groups use known characteristics of species to group them into composites of species expected to respond similarly to environmental gradients. This type of work has been happening for a little while um, and actually across a whole lot of different um, taxa as well. So recently, if you saw my talk yesterday, I've also done some work on um, vegetation in the Coorong using trait analysis as well. So we also sought to test the proportion of these trait groups associated with levels of, um, level of inter intermittency uh, described by the number of flow days over 10 years. So we, looked at, we took um, samples that we could um, relate to that. So we, took the, we used flow gauges that had that number of years of data. And these are the sp some of the specific traits um, that we used. Um, we looked at um, ecological conductivity tolerance, reproduction, food preference, respiration mode, volcanism, time to maturity, dispersal, uh, period of terrestrial life stages, and functional feeding groups. And as I mentioned earlier, we were looking at, um, we used these traits to look at whether or not we thought the groups that we came up with um, had predominantly resistance or resilient strategies um, towards a drying climate or increases in zero flow days. Um, so this is, this is the underlying um, uh, cluster analysis that we use to, um, to create those trait groups. And I'll show you these on the next slide. So we came up with a number of different trait groups, eight different um, trait groups, I think. Um, and you can see that they were actually associated with um, particular different, um, different traits. So you can see um, these different trait groups, some of them were associated with a food type, with a certain food pre preference. Um, but I explain those a little bit more on the next slide. And I did an anasim just to make sure that those trait groups were actually distinct from one another. So these were the groups that I came up with, not very excitingly named, but I tried to um, yeah, I come up with names that gave them um, a bit more of a I don't know, general applicability. So if you look um, here, we've got resistant obligate aquatic flow avoiders um, and, and down to resistant low dispersing flow avoiders and resilient resistant gill respiring um, obligate, obligate aquatics. So I was able to use those traits or the characteristics to group the, the groups together. And then also, so in the Mount Lofty Ranges, a lot of the taxa that we found that are, are, are present are those that are resistant, those that are, that are able to hang on rather than those that are necessarily able to come back over time. And we predicted that we would find an increase in taxa um, that had resistant um, stages with, zero, with increasing zero flow um, and a decrease in those trait groups that had resilient um, characteristics. And you can see that the, those predictions generally held up, although there is, a, a, there is a large amount of scatter in the data, which does suggest that there's other factors that um, are contributing as well. But you can see here with increasing, um, with increasing uh, flow intermittency or zero flow days that we've got an increase in, in trait group C. 
Um, we've also got a decrease in numbers of EPT taxa, um, which are your generally thought to be less tolerant species um, overall in terms of a water quality sense as well. Similarly, we've got a decreasing trade in, in trait group F um, and trait group H. So, but where to next with these data? Um, and this is something that um, Doug Green spoke about a little bit on Wednesday, where we're using these data in terms of being able to come up, um, come up with risk profiles. So we need to be able to translate, and this is work we, that we're still undertaking, is actually able to translate these, um, these relationships that we've found into different levels of risk. And they will then feed into our, um, the general risk management framework that we use in water allocation plans. Um, and, and particularly inform the risk analysis part of it, where we actually take different, um, we take different flow scenarios or different management scenarios and then predict um, what the outcomes for various taxa will be um, based on those different um, scenarios. And we've done similar work for that um, in the Barossa Valley, but we've, we've yet to translate that for, them, for the Mount Lofties. But that will, will likely happen um, for their next iterations of their water allocation plans. So in conclusion, uh, we were able to cre create trait groups um, which have a range of consistently occurring traits. Um, and as I said, these can then be used um, in other areas across the state because it's not necess it, it doesn't matter about taxonomic classifications. Like certain areas like, say, um, uh, Kangaroo Island might have slightly different taxa, but they still fall within these different trait groups. And we found that resistant trait groups increase with increasing flow intermittency. And we found that resilient trait groups generally decreased. And those are the taxa that, um, that we would be hoping to respond and improve with management actions that are planned um, for the Mount Lofty Ranges, um, such as the introduction of low flowed bypasses or threshold flow rates. And I think that would also be really interesting for, um, for Nick's work and the fish in terms of those increased flows, if it does actually mean that water holds in those dams longer, um, whether we see um, recovery or at least a sustaining of those fish populations as well. And so, um, and as I said, these relationships are then able to be used in water planning. And thank you very much to all my co-collaborators and for the funding for this project through Goiter. Um, yeah, thanks very much. We've actually got a minute for questions, if there's any. No questions? All right, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, Lara Suda from Department of Environment and Water and Natural Resources. Thanks, Sarah. 